Welcome to Introduction to Christianity with Dr. Owen Anderson. We're going to look today at the prologue to the Gospel of John. So this is the very beginning of the Gospel of John. Chapter 1. How does John, John the Apostle, the disciple that we often read about in the New Testament, author of this book, but also the author of three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then also the author of Revelation, how does he present this one that he'd spent time with being one of the central three disciples? There was uh, Peter, John, and John's brother James, who were often singled out or tripled out together and spent time with Christ. Who is this? How would he present this one he spent time with? And that's, that's what we're going to see here. And especially think about that as we have uh, times of the year where Christians celebrate the death and resurrection of Christ. Why did Christ have to die? Couldn't he just have given, given good teaching and uh, stuck around and done more miracles? I mean, if he died and then was raised from the dead, he continues to be alive. Why not just skip the die part? And continue to be alive. So we're going to see some of that uh, explained here in the Gospel of John. Why Christ had to die and uh, be raised from the dead. So the prologue speaks of the word of God. The Greek there is logos or logos. The word of God. And that Greek term that we translate word. And I think there's a good reason to translate it word. But we can also see how that Greek term means the reason for something. And we'll see how that comes out in the translation word. And this word is the only, is the one by whom all things were made. I'm going to go over a synopsis of it here, then go back and we'll look at the text in more detail. So that by which all things were made and consider what that means. If the word of God is that by which all things were made. Then the word of God wasn't made. The word of God can't be one of the things that was made. So all things that had a beginning, all things that were made, were made by the word of God. And so here's how it says it in the text. In the beginning was the word, the logos. So there's a beginning. And already the word is there, which tells you this word is without beginning, eternal. Because it's not, it's not like a, a beginning, like the class had a beginning, many classes have beginnings. The beginning of all things, the word was already there, meaning didn't have beginning. And then getting increasingly more precise, the word was with God. And the word was God. The word is both with God and is God. So how do we understand that in without a contradiction? Starting to bring out the doctrine of what it is to be the son of God and God. Now it goes from the word was with God to he was with God in the beginning. Now this is personal. Not The Logos is not a force. Some Greek philosophers like Heraclitus had spoken of that same term. And it's more like the force of all things. It keeps all things together. But here we're, we're transitioning to the personal. He was with God in the beginning is God and was with God in the beginning, meaning the word of God didn't have a beginning, is eternal. Now, a lot of times when you say that phrase, word of God, people bring into their minds the Bible, right? They say, hey, uh, where's the word of God? Uh, they'll hand you a copy of the Bible. Or if not that, they mean Jesus incarnate, which is the, Jesus is the word of God incarnate. So you say one of those two usually. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. But this doesn't mean either one of those yet. This is before the Bible and before the incarnation. 
the eternal word of God, having existed from eternity without a beginning by which all things were made. And so it reiterates that. And the personal here in verse three, through him, all things were made. Without him, was, without him, nothing was made that has been made. So being very precise, if something was made, had a beginning, it was made by the word. The word, therefore, can't be one of the things that was made. Because then it would be having made itself, right? It didn't exist yet, but then it existed to make itself exist. No. So being very clear about this point, the word is eternal, had no beginning. And that's in contrast to a number of worldviews, including uh, Gnosticism, which might say that there's that the first created thing is Sophia, wisdom. First God created wisdom, then God created everything else. And this is saying, no, that's not what happened. The Logos has existed from eternity, is with God and is God. And is personal. He. So we get that first sense of the word of God, the eternal word of God. And we're going to shift into saying the son of God. And the reason why we can, we can see how this translation word makes sense is that that's what words do. Words make things known. Your words make known your ideas to the rest of us. And the same for me, right? My words right now are making known to you my ideas, which you can't see or hear. You don't, you don't see an idea or hear an idea. You might see the, the English writing or whatever language. You hear the spoken word, but you don't, those are expressions of the invisible ideas. So the word makes the invisible known. That's the role of the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And this word is making is, is that by which God makes himself known to all. So verse four now in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. Two key terms now life and light. How are, what are those? How do those relate together? I mean, if you just came to this text and you hadn't read any of the scriptures and even worse, you hadn't understood anything from general revelation, you wouldn't probably get this. What is life here? Uh, normally people seem to think that just means physical life, right? Well, well, that can't be what it means here though. Life, physical life, is the light of mankind? That doesn't work. And, and what is light here? Does that mean physical light? Photons bouncing off things and going into your retina? That's what the logos is? Well, that doesn't fit. Okay, so we're into spiritual life and light. And we use that phrase that way still. A light bulb comes on in your mind. Light is shining in your mind. Now I get it. It's that by which I understand. And understanding is life. Especially beginning with understanding or knowing God. That's eternal life, John tells us later in John 17, 3. So in him is that life that I just described. And that life of understanding is the light of all mankind. And that's why I said that that overlaps with the idea of reason. The Logos is reason is that by which we understand anything at all. And so he says here now in verse five, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. What's going on there? There's a tension. There's the light and the darkness and the darkness rejects the light, but can't overcome it. It's just the opposite. Think about a dark room and you flip the light switch the light, it's as if, as if the darkness flees, right? The light just goes into all corners of the room. And so we'll see that conflict. Uh, so back up here to the description. The word has been rejected as reason. 
the darkness rejects that life, that light of all mankind. So it, we have, we're, gonna, we're looking here at five senses of the word of God and the ways in which that has been rejected. Reason, creation, Oh, yeah. Eternal Son of God. Scripture incarnate. And how these have been rejected. So the people say, yeah, I, I don't uh, need reason. And they reject reason. So then uh, uh, there's a little bit here where I have the ellipses discussion of who John is, John the Baptist. There's John the disciple who wrote this book. Then there's John the Baptist who is a witness to this light. So then I go down to verse nine, the light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Then it says he was already in the world. Well, wait, how could it be both? He's coming into the world. He's already in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. That's creation back here or general revelation. The word is already making God known in creation, in general revelation. And it's been rejected. People rejected what's clear about God. And instead they made idols or they served themselves and didn't love God. They did not recognize him. Then in 11, he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. That's scripture. The prophets bring the word of God and scripture to his own, to those who claim to be believers. But as he went through the Old Testament, we saw how they rebelled against Moses. They didn't keep the law of God in Israel. They often killed the prophets who brought them the word of God. So they did not rec they uh, did not receive him in scripture. But to those who did, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become sons of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And, and we'd already covered John chapter three, where he talks about being born again and the spirit, being born of the spirit. And so you're anticipating that, right? We're back on chapter one now. And then we get to chapter three, we see this developed more. So yet to all who did receive him, they become children of God. So contrast that with the eternal son of God. He didn't become a son. He's eternally a son. But because of his work, those who are otherwise lost in darkness can become sons by believing in his name, which means not everyone is. Those who don't believe in his name aren't children of God. And then 14, the word, notice the word has been rejected as reason, rejected as general revelation, rejected as special revelation. So now the word becomes flesh and made his dwelling upon us. Now among us, now we have the incarnation. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth in his human nature did not exist from eternity. That's one of the main uh, holidays of the Christians. Christmas when Jesus was born. So his human nature had a beginning in Bethlehem. And you, you, you should know the story, right? But that's the incarnation of the eternal son of God who had no beginning. So we have two natures, one person with two natures, both human and divine. Why did the word of God become flesh to dwell among us? Well, you see, because of the other rejections of the senses of the word of God. Those were there already. You could use those. You should use those. You didn't use those. Now the word becomes flesh. Will the word of God be treated any differently than the prophets were? It's, in fact, it's one of the things that Jesus points out when he speaks with, with the Pharisees. Your forefathers killed the prophets, and you build monuments to them. So the word of God will be treated the same way. The word of God incarnate will be treated the same way as the word of God has been treated 
in these other forms, rejected, despised, and ultimately killed with the idea that we'll get rid of the word of God and not have to deal with it. We'll kill him. So John says, ending this section, we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son. So again, how does that work? One and only son, but then right here it said you could become children of God, right? Becoming children of God versus the one and only eternal son. Meaning this, son is the personal form of word. Just like a word makes known the invisible thoughts, a son makes his father known. So this is not a son in the sense of God has a wife and together they have a baby named the son of God. Uh, that's called the pagan trinity. That's what the Egyptians believed or the, the Mesopotamians believed. That's not what's being taught here, whether in, in Genesis or in John. Because the son here is eternal, meaning there wasn't a time when the son was not. The son always existed. So son isn't about having had a beginning. Son is about the relationship of making your father known. So just like there's an eternal father, you, you can't be a father if there's no son. So if there was once no son, there was also once no father. But if God is the eternal, if there's God the Father eternally, then there's also God the Son eternally. And it's describing a relationship, an eternal relationship of the Son making the Father known. Finally, in this, uh, that's why it says the only Son, that's the eternal Son, the only Son, who came from the Father, making the Father known, full of grace and truth. These relate to justice and mercy or mercy and justice in this way. Humans who rejected the word of God could have been left there in darkness. They don't deserve, there's no obligation on God's part to do anything more than that. They pursue darkness. They can live in the consequences of darkness. But in the mercy of God, the grace of God is revealed in the word also becoming flesh and dwelling among us to continue revealing God the Father. And that's a revelation in itself of the, the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. And yet, in this greatest expression of the mercy of God, we'll see the deepest darkness of the human heart, both at that time and ongoing, as Christ is rejected, 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 and then killed. And people will say, uh, I would never have done that. If I lived, I would have thrown myself in front of the Roman guards. Well, no, the teaching, the implication is anybody would have done and has done the same thing in rejecting the word of God. Already back up here, having rejected reason by not using it. Having rejected creation by not seeing what's clear about God. And so that's where truth comes in or justice comes in. The truth about the human condition is not good. It's dark. Humans justify themselves. Remember back to Genesis chapter three. They don't know what they should know. They put themselves in the place of God. They deceive themselves about this condition. They justify themselves about this condition. And it's those things that build up to the crucifixion. From Genesis 3, humans have one, not known what they should have known, two, put themselves in the place of God, three, deceived themselves about this, four, justify themselves to others. What will it take to redeem humans from this condition, right? In, and that's what we saw in Genesis 3. It took the curse, natural evil, and the promise. The seed of the woman. 
both of those. And so now we have that fulfillment, that seed of the woman, the eternal word of God becoming incarnate, full of grace and truth. How will humans, you think humans would rejoice and say, this is great. Even the ones who did, because you think about the uh, uh, Palm Sunday and people in Jerusalem rejoicing when he comes into Jerusalem, even they though want to make him king in a, in, in a way that's not the same as his redeeming them. So they either misunderstand his, his uh, office or they completely reject him altogether. And yet he continues full of grace and truth. So the word of God, here's how John presents us. John, who was with Christ in that incarnation, in his earthly ministry, it's called, describes him this way, the eternal word of God, the eternal son of God who makes God known, through whom all things were created. The light of man that shines in the darkness. So the word of God, as we, as we go through, whether we're simply going through the New Testament or we're thinking about the time of the year when Christians celebrate things like Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Resurrection Day, think about who is that word of God that's being remembered at those times. And here, here's how John presents him. 